Anyway, Fidel Castro died in 2016. But before that, he handed power over to his uh, younger brother, Raul Castro. Castro. And since then, uh, there's been a sort of evidence of improvement here. There's uh, occasional glimpses of more modern machinery and uh, a diversion of crops away from sugar. But the, uh, these large state farms are grossly inefficient. Uh, and Cuba still has to import a sizable amount of its food. The military still own all of the land which is, in one way is a good thing because it prevents inflation of land values. The small holdings which were given to the agricultural workers, they're, they're now bigger. And if you want to farm in Cuba, or if you're Cuban and you want to farm in Cuba, uh, the state will give you uh, 165 acres the big problem with it is much of this idle land is, is covered or is, is being taken over by a tenacious thorny bush called Marabou. It's everywhere, mile after mile after mile of it, absolute thicket. I mean even goats, which will normally eat everything if you give them a chance, they would, they would have major problems getting rid of this. And if the state do give you this land, it's, the initial contracts or the initial leases for 10 years, well, it would take you 10 years to clear this. Um, but there is the option of a, a, an extension of another 10 years and so on. The other thing is that you can now build property on your farm, which you couldn't do before, and uh, you can pass it down the family, which again you couldn't do before. The downside is that you've got to sell 90% of your produce to the state, and price is decided by them, and of course like all farmers, they all think the prices are far too low. Um, it's like the amusing story when they, when they were telling us about this, that uh, they said that they had to sell 90% of the state and the other 30% they kept to themselves. There was a sort of great chorus of, uh, oh, not 30, but 10%. And of course, uh, we were told that uh, farmers weren't very good at sums. So this, uh, and they can sell this 10% of, uh, of their crop uh, privately and uh, now you see farmers markets appearing, the, sort of the first signs of capitalism. When it comes to private ownership, of course, initially there was none of this. The state provided you with a house and if you wanted to move, you had to find somebody else to exchange houses with, and it had to be approved, of course, by the military. Uh, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't sell your property, you could only pass it down from the main family. Um, today that's changing. Um, houses can now be bought and sold, but uh, there are severe restrictions for foreigners. I think you have to be married to a Cuban or something similar. Uh, most housing is still owned by the state and it's, uh, it's in a pretty shoddy condition, particularly in towns. They, some of these here mansions are in an absolutely desperate state. Some of them have just collapsed and left there and be heaps of rubble. I mean, luxury cars are the other thing. I mean, they're severely taxed. Only one, ten, 
Only one in ten families in Cuba has a car. And most of the cars are Russian and ancient. The most common being the larder. But even worse is the, is the Moskvich. You also see little Polsky Fiat's about the place as well. Many of these cars were given to minor officials uh, before the Soviet collapse as a sort of reward for their loyalty. But even now, a sort of ten year old lad, or even older than that, um, fetches somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, the only upside to it is, of course, that the place has got masses of ladder space. You're not going to run out of space for donkey's years. The other thing are these huge American cars abandoned during the 1959 exodus. I mean, many of them are sort of V8s, they absolutely sup petrol. And because of that, most of them were just left in garages or outbuildings for years and years and years because they couldn't afford to run the things. And that probably explains why they're still about. Low mileage. Uh, they're mainly used as taxis and, and are very popular with tourists. I thought there was just a few of these, but there's thousands of them. And not just in the cities, but all over the, all over the island. I mean, some of them are absolutely immaculate, and some of them are falling to bits. But with uh, with tourism on the increase and uh, and a limited supply, uh, some of these cars cost upwards of fifty thousand dollars. There's no credit in Cuba, there's no credit cards, uh, no bank loan, there's no mortgages, everything is cash. So if you want to buy a house in Cuba, then it's cash only. The money is sent from a family in the uh, USA. Um, I mean, many are expecting a change in Cuban-American relationships, or at least they were until President Trump came on the scene. Uh, and some of these houses cost over a million dollars. Cash. So, uh, probably take some weeks to count it. The big problem of changing ownership in Cuba is the paperwork. I mean, if somebody needed some cash and, uh, and you bought their car on the quiet, you didn't get the paperwork with it. So if you died, the car <laughs> reverted back to the previous order. And of course, you couldn't report this to the authorities. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have been in serious trouble for buying it in the first place. When it comes to private enterprise, uh, until recently, this wasn't allowed. All businesses were owned by the state. And uh, you needed a license to run it. And usually you were only allowed one business. If you had a restaurant, not, you might be allowed two, I'm not sure, but you certainly couldn't have a chain of restaurants. And penalties for disobedience were severe, ruthless. But now more and more, Private businesses are being encouraged, uh, but you still need a license. One of the more obvious were people renting rooms in their houses in tourist tourist areas, and, uh, or running a, a small restaurant. But 
away from them. It's, it's not very common. The two big pluses in Cuba are health and education. Healthcare is completely free. I mean, even in the most remote communities, nobody is more than three kilometres away from a doctor's surgery. The surgery is downstairs and the, uh, the doctor lives upstairs. It's a condition of a doctor's education that when they finished their six years at university, they have to do two years in a place decided by the, uh, the military or the state. After that, they can do, you know, they can do what they like within Cuba. It's a, it's a walk-in service. There's no, you don't have to go and book an appointment to see somebody two or three weeks down the line. And every large town has an excellent hospital. Education is also completely free. There are no private schools at all. Every community has a primary school. Even if it's only got two pupils, it still has a school. Pupils progress from primary school to junior high school. And if a pupil lives in a remote area and can't get to a junior high school every day, then there are boarding schools. Again, it's all free. I mean, uniforms, which are the same in every sector, it's all primary school children wear red and junior high school children wear yellow and boarding school pupils wear blue is heavily subsidised. I think you get two uniforms a year or two sets of uniforms for each year. And of course books and all the other implements you need are again all free. East Large Town has an excellent university which is also free. And if you need a lodge in the town, because you can't get home every day, then again is provided by the state. All pupils must attend school until they're 18. Otherwise, they can't get a, a job other than as a, an agricultural or construction labourer. If you want anything better than that, then you have to go to school until you're 18. So those of you with a a £30,000 debt following university or still shelling out £9 for prescriptions <laughs> or, or waiting for a year before you can get your hip replaced, uh, think on. When it comes to money, it's a strange place. There are two currencies. One is the local currency, the Cuban peso, which is a C-U-P as they call it, the coupe, which is worth about 37 to the pound, or 27 to the dollar if you're watching this in America. The other is used by tourists and it's called the uh, Cuban convertible currency, the CUC or Cook. And there's about, I think it's on a par with a dollar, it's about one cook per dollar, or when I was there, it was 1.37 cooks per pound. The separate currencies have been a sort of somewhat crude but effective method to prevent ordinary Cubans from coming into contact with tourists. which of course the authorities might cause unrest. Sort of. So 
seeing how the other half live, as it were. You can't buy cooks in the United Kingdom. You have to wait until you get to Cuba. And there are state-controlled exchanges called Cadecas. Uh, you find them in all the big hotels. And they, they all have the same rate. Uh, and of course they stayed on. Uh, queuing to change money at the Kadeka, especially in the morning, was a painfully slow business. So if you go in there and you, and you need to change money, it's best to choose sometime later in the day when it's a bit more quiet. Um, and check it check the rate and make sure you get a receipt is the other thing. I mean major towns have ATMs, you often see people queuing, for, queuing at the ATM and of course the uh, hotel's front desk will also change money but uh, the rate there isn't, isn't very good. But uh, you say if you're desperate, well, the Kadeka is closed. A small can of beer was roughly two cooks for about What's that, one pound sixty? Living. Well, it was very difficult to get a handle on this. Because everybody seemed to have a TV and a fridge, a washing machine. Uh, and I was surprised just how many had a cell phone. I mean, seemingly the cell phones are sent by uh, friends or relatives who managed to get to the United States. The cost of living is incredibly low. It's one of the lowest in the world. And uh, there are subsistent rations for everybody. Uh, especially if you are, as, it, as they call it, awaiting redeployment <laughs> or re-employment. I mean, the latest figures su suggest that the sort of highly qualified medical staff, doctors for instance, earn about £30 a month. Difficult to believe, really. And the average monthly wage is about £20. Right. This is why some menial tasks in tourism are highly sought after. I mean, with a cook worth a dollar, you, know, you don't need many tips to uh, to double or even more your wages. So you you often find highly qualified people working in hotels doing the most menial of jobs, gardening or you know, room maids, whatever. There was very little in the shops. What shops I could see, oh, I went into a, a, a look in a pharmacy. Uh, and, uh, it was remarkably sparse. If something does arrive, then usually a queue falls very, very quickly. I mean, toiletries and pharmaceuticals uh, seem to be particularly in demand. The attitude seemed to be if you saw something you bought it, <laughs> on the off chance you might need it later on. Or maybe somebody else might need it later on and you could sell it to them for a, a small profit. And uh, off the beaten track um, I found little little markets selling lots of second hand things. A bit like uh, car boot sales really. Uh, all sorts of ancient things like Mincers, <laughs> I remember seeing carpet beaters. Uh, things from years and years and years ago. Usually, I, I, I try to get it at a supermarket. They give you a good indication of what things are, are really like for the ordinary citizen. Uh, but in Cuba, I, I don't recollect seeing a big supermarket. When Cubans go abroad, those who are lucky to do it. They take big suitcases with next to nothing in, so when they're abroad, they buy lots and lots of things which are in short supply in Cuba and, and uh, 
and bring them back and I suppose a, a sort of black market where, where they sell them for a, little, for a, mile, a small profit. So entrepreneurs in the making. <laughs>